Mark chapter 1, verse 14 through 20, and I'm reading out of the ESV version. It says this, it says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God, and saying, The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, uh, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. Come on, you guys. The title of this message is, What is a Disciple? And I want to talk to you guys about cultural influence cultural influence. Can we pray? Lord Jesus, I thank you for every person in this room, and I just say, Holy Spirit, do it again. Just do it again, God. We give this next hour unto you. Come on, in Jesus' mighty name we pray, and everybody said, amen. Amen. Well, there's this old saying that goes like this. It says, you can count the fruit on a tree, but can you count the fruits in a seed? And in 1855, there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball, Now, Kimball, he had a mission, and his mission was to pray for and disciple all the young boys and the rough young men that came through his Sunday school class. And there was this one young man in particular that caught his eye, who came to Sunday school. He did not know anything about Christianity, did not know anything about the Bible, and so he made it his mission over the course of the next year to disciple this young man. And in fact, one day, Prompted by the Holy Spirit, Kimball would go to where this young man was working. He was stocking shelves in his uncle's business, and he went straight to this young man, and he said, Dude, you need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He started to talk to him about the importance of what it is to have a personal relationship with Jesus. He shared the good news and the gospel message with him, and this young man gave his heart to Christ right then and there at his uncle's business. And that young man was known by the name of Dwight L. Moody. And we know who Moody is. If you know who Moody is, you know that his ministry and his impact in this world is, 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 is incredible. But the story doesn't stop there, you guys, because under Moody, another man's heart was touched by God uh, by the name of William Chapman. And Chapman was discipled by Moody, and he became an evangelist, and he preached to thousands upon thousands of people. Well, under Chapman, another young man's heart was touched by the name of Billy Sunday. Who was Billy Sunday? He was a famous baseball player back in the olden days uh, who gave his heart to Christ. He stopped playing baseball, and he started to preach the gospel. Well, under Sunday, another man by the name of Morgan, Mordecai Ham uh, was, uh, was converted and discipled by him who would go on to preach to thousands and thousands. Well, under Mordecai Ham, there was another troubled young man that came into one of his meetings. And he would end up giving his heart to Christ at the meeting and be changed forever. And that young man's name is Billy Graham. Can I just say, you can clap for Billy. We love Billy Graham in here. Come on. You can attribute most of the churches across the USA to Billy Graham right now. It it, it was said that he went on to preach to thousands upon thousands more people than has ever lived. And can I just tell you today that discipleship matters? That discipleship matters? That maybe when Jesus said this in, 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 in Matthew chapter 28, when he said, go and make disciples, you think he might have knew what he was talking about? That see, discipleship matters. Can I just say that you were born for maximum impact? That you were born for cultural influence right here, right now, in this day and age? That you were born to make a difference in someone else's life? Come on, you and I, we've been called as disciples of Jesus to flip this world upside down. We have been called to impact this world in this generation. You have been called to make a difference in someone else's life, but there's a huge problem in our Western culture and in the Western, in the Western church. You see, you see, we get discipleship wrong a lot of the times, and, 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 and we, 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 we stop short of truly living out what true discipleship is, and therefore we have little to no influence in our culture. You know what the church is really good at? Making converts. You know what we're bad at? Making disciples. We really are. 
we're bad about making disciples. And you see the vision here at City Point is to see a decision become a disciple, right? We want people coming through the doors. We want them giving their hearts to Christ. We want them to hear the gospel message and make that decision and that choice to say, yes, I want to follow Jesus with everything I have. But not only that, we don't want to just leave them there in that decision. We want to take a decision and we want to turn it into a disciple. Why? Because you can count the fruit on a tree, but can you count the fruit in a seed? Right, that that disciple will go on to disciple more and more and more, just like our opening story. You see, there's a huge difference between being a believer in Jesus and being a follower of him. Anyone can believe in Jesus, even the demons believe, and guess what, they tremble. But there are very few who can follow him. And if you read the Gospels and you hear some of the stuff that came out of Jesus' mouth, he said some wild things, you guys. He said things like, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no place in me. And I got to be honest with you, man. If Aaron, Pastor Aaron came to me and he said, hey, Rick, you got to eat my flesh and drink my blood, bro. (laughs) I got to be honest with you. I'm probably going to be like, peace out. I'm out of (laughs) here. You know, like that was a hard saying. He said things like, unless you hate your mother and your father, you have no place in me. He said these hard things. Why? Because there's a cost to follow him. There is a cost to follow him. It's going to cost you something. In fact, it might cost you everything. But even though there's a cost to follow him, there's an even greater cost not to follow Jesus. It's called eternal separation from God. It's a greater cost. And he says this in Luke 9, 24. He says, for whoever will save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so in the Western church, The term disciple, it's become Christianese, so to speak. And when we hear it, we don't know what to do with it because I have a limited understanding of what a true disciple is. And we reduce discipleship to a class, right, that we have on a a Saturday, or we reduce it to a life group where we say, you know what, that discipleship thing, it's only for my pastor. Pastor Aaron, I'm going to bring my friend to Pastor Aaron, and Pastor Aaron's going to disciple him because it's reserved for those who have a special calling uh, in discipleship. And we use this as an excuse to disqualify us from partaking in it. You know what I call it? Consumer Christianity. That's what it is. It's consumerism where I just come and I'm spiritually apathetic, I'm spiritually obese, and it's all about me to just sit in this room and just consume, 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 and I come to the buffet table of spiritualism and I sit there and I go from church to church, city to city, place to place, to get a special word from God, to get get my need fulfilled when I don't ever give back to the community. It's called consumer Christianity. Let me just say this, you guys. We have a generation right now who's being discipled by social media. There is. There's a generation of children being discipled by influencers on social media. Your latest TikTok influencer, right? Your Instagram influencer. For some of the old guys in the the room, your Facebook influencers, right? Children aren't on Facebook anymore, you guys. If you're on Facebook, you're in my generation. We're in our 40s. We're in our 40s, you guys. It's time to take your ibuprofen because you know your back hurts, right? (laughs) You know it. You know it. (laughs) Did you know that there's after-school satanic clubs that are discipling our children? And they're in our schools. If you want a good laugh, go to the Satanic Temple website, and you'll see the deception that is being exuded out there in in our current culture. I went and looked at the mission statement for the After School Satan Club, and the mission statement is this. It says, proselytization is not our goal, really. And we're not interested in converting children to Satanism. Are you sure about that? After School Satan Clubs will focus on free inquiry and rationalism, the scientific basis for which we know what we know about the world around us. Listen to this. We prefer to give children an appreciation for the natural wonders surrounding them, not a fear of everlasting otherworldly horrors. Of course, the enemy doesn't want them to fear of the everlasting otherworldly horror because it is true, you guys. It is true. And we have a generation that is being discipled by the world right now. Taylor Swift, you guys, I'm telling you, she is, she is having demonic practices and witchcraft at her concerts. Oh, that Pastor Rick, he's just so crazy, man. He's so crazy. No, I'm not. It's true. 
If you listen to her music, you need to stop. Because it is demonic influence that's coming in through the speakers. And you, you can call me a radical all you want, but when you turn on the TV and you see one of her concerts, you can't argue with me. She's doing witchcraft on the platform, you guys. Taylor Swift is discipling her children. And I just hate the fact that she's dating Travis Kelsey, man. I hate it. I'm not for it. I'm against it. I know. I need to repent. It's a new year. It's a new season. It might be your year. Let me just say this. Everyone in this room is called to discipleship. Everybody. If you name yourself in the name of Jesus, you call yourself a disciple. You are called to be discipled, and you are called to disciple someone else. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said this. He said, Christianity without discipleship is always Christianity without Christ. You cannot have the, the, the two difference. They're one in the same things. You see, discipleship in the ancient biblical times was so much different than our Western comfortable culture. You see, discipleship back then uh, was a deliberate apprenticeship. It, it, it made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master. You see, in our culture, a disciple is a learner or a student. In the ancient culture, you became your master. You became your master. Everything you did would exude the one that you are following. You and I have been called to become a living copy of our master. His name is Jesus Christ. You have been called to be a copy of Jesus Christ. Can I just say this, that you have been given the authority to live like Jesus did. You have. If you call yourself a Christian and the Holy Spirit is on the inside of you, you have the authority to live like Jesus lived. You can walk like Jesus walked. You can talk like Jesus talked. You can heal like Jesus healed. You can cast out a demon just like Jesus casted out a demon. You can raise the dead, yes, just like Jesus rose the dead. You can cleanse a leper just like Jesus did. And you can resurrect in your life just like Jesus did. Oh, I know I'm giving you a lot more than you're giving me right now, 12 o'clock service. Come on, you guys. This is good news. This is good news. You have the authority to live like Jesus lived. We have been called to be a copy, a representation of our master. His name is Jesus. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore be imitators of God as, as beloved children. I just love my little son when he walks and runs around in this room. And if you, see, if you see Josiah running around, you know that's little Ricky. And if you, saw, if you saw a picture of me when I was five years old, I look just like him and he looks just like me. We are called to be an exact representation of Jesus. So let me ask you this. Are you living like Jesus lived? Does your lives reflect his character? Let me go a little bit deeper. Who are you when you're alone? When no one else is looking? When that door's shut? When you're up late? When no one else is around? Who are you when you're alone? Do you know we have three faces? We have a public face where everybody gets to see. That's not our real face. We have a private face where your spouse gets to see, or you know, your children, or a few select friends. And then we have a secret face, which no one else sees but your Savior. This is why we are going after revival in our secret place, you guys, because we know if you can have revival in your secret place, with your secret place, with your secret face, then you can bring revival into your private. You can bring revival into your public. It is, it, it is in the secret place, you guys, that matters the most. Because what is done there is projected into the natural. Maybe, just maybe, you need someone to disciple you. Maybe you need to reach out to somebody and say, hey, can you bring some accountability in my life? Can you mentor me? Can you pour into me? Can you hold me accountable? How are you doing with pornography? How are you doing with lust? Right? How are you doing with that anger? How are you doing with those things that are weighing you down? That's what discipleship is all about. It's holding each other accountable. And this has been the way from the beginning of time. You cannot be a stagnant pool of information. We cannot be obese Christians, man, just getting all of this knowledge and information fed into us without giving it back out to someone else. 
You see, if we can just get this right, you guys, if we can just understand the, the, the discipleship and how discipleship matters and we can just begin to disciple one another and allow ourselves to be discipled, you and I can change a generation. We can see a city change and set on fire for Jesus. We can see a judicial system set on fire for Jesus. If you want to see the school system change, start to disciple the younger generation because those are the ones that are coming up. The enemy understands this. That's why he has satanic after-school clubs. When are the Christians going to get it and understand that it all starts with discipleship? So this morning, or this afternoon, it's already one, I have three practical points that I want to give you guys in the area of discipleship. And so what is a disciple? Point number one is this. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. Really simple. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. Look at Mark 117, and we're going to use this first for the remainder of the message. Chapter 17, or verse 17 says this, And Jesus said to them, what? Follow me. Really simple, right? The Greek word for follow is the Greek word duta, which basically means to come. So in other words, Jesus was extending an invitation to come and extending a calling for the disciples to come and follow him him. You see, following Jesus always begins with an invitation. Did you know that? It always begins with an invitation. It always begins with him, him inviting you to step into life with him, inviting you to step into peace with him, inviting you to step into this journey with him. But it's up to you to respond to that invitation. And when you first responded to that invitation, if you call yourself a Christian, you responded with repentance and belief, right? When you heard the gospel message that Jesus Christ came and he died for your sins, uh, right? That if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, right? The scriptures say you will be saved, right? That is the gospel in, in, in essence, right? And when we heard that message, we repented and we believed. We responded to that invitation. But now that you are a disciple and you're born into the family, we respond now with a choice to choose a daily life of surrender to him. It's a daily life of surrender. And he says this in Luke 9, 23. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and let him pick up his cross and let him follow me. What is a cross? It's your death. <laughs> That's all it is. It's like we wear, you know, we wear crosses on our necks. What, what, would, it, what would it look like if we had like a, an electric chair on our necks, Right? It's just the way Jesus died. He died to himself. And so what he's saying, he's saying, die to yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. It's a daily decision and a daily choice for you and I to, 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 to be invited into this life with Jesus and grab a hold of it. And I just, I love uh, back in 1998 at a normal church service, it was just like this. I heard the call of God in my life and I responded and I went up to the front of the room and, and our very own a global pastor, Mark Ramsey, uh, Pastor Becky's dad, prophesied over me that I had a pastoral call on my life, that one day I was going to be a pastor. But I was 15, I was young, and I was dumb, and I did not understand what that meant. I didn't have nobody discipling me, so I ran from that calling. It, it took me into a very dark place for four and a half years of, of complete darkness in my life, and I ended up in prison with a five-year prison sentence. But when I got out... I was a changed man, and I heard Pastor Aaron and Pastor Becky had a church plan up here in Loveland, Colorado, and I said, man, I got to go check this out. And then one day, I was ordained to be a pastor right here on this platform in, two, uh, in, in, in 2019. That's 26 years. You can count clap for that. You guys, that's 26 years. It took me 26 years. It took me countless tears. It took me a five-year prison sentence. An innocent man lost his life and all the other crap that came along with that. Can I just say, stop running from your calling in God. Stop running from the invitation. Stop running from that thing that you know you should be doing for Jesus. Stop running from it. There's a life of joy and bliss awaiting for you on the other side. But will you just answer the call to him today? A discipler is one who follows Christ. Is one, it's the called out ones. It's the one that is called into life and relationship with him. And you see, Jesus is standing at the door knocking. 
And he's not knocking on unbelievers' hearts. He's knocking on the church's heart. Will you guys just let me in already? Will you let me in? I'm calling you. Stop running from the calling. And Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says this, For the giftings and callings of God, they're irrevocable. Another translation says they're without repentance. You know what that means? That means that God's not going to change his mind about you. That he's not going to change his mind about the callings that is on your life. If God called you to it, guess what? That calling is still there. It is waiting for you, whether you have obeyed it or not. But we get to choose to walk in that calling or not. Will you choose him? Will you choose to say yes to Jesus? Will you respond to that invitation of life and life more abundantly? As I look around this room, there's a lot of young people in this room, and, and you say, Pastor Rick, I don't know what the calling of God is for my life. And some of you young people that are, that are going into college, or maybe you're in college or just graduated college, and you have this degree that you're like, I don't even know why I got the degree. You have all these external pressures on you, pressing up against you, and, and now all of a sudden, Pastor, you're telling me I have to have a calling of God in my life, and I have to respond to that and all these other things. But can I just simplify it for you for a moment? It's not something that's just way out there that you're just waiting one day and all of a sudden you're going to go and drop all your nets. No, it's easy. And if you go to uh, Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 and 8, this is how easy the calling of God is for your life. This is the calling for every disciple in Jesus. He says, proclaim as you go, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Preach the gospel. Preach the good news. And then he says this, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, Cast out demons. You have received without paying. Give without pay. That's how simple the calling of God is for your life, Christian. Would you put your hand to the plow? Would you begin to operate in the power and the authority that God has given you on your life? And you see, how we get there is up to your response. A disciple is what? Someone who follows Jesus. Point number two is this. A disciple is someone who is being changed by Jesus. Someone who is being changed by Jesus. Look at verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will what? Make you become. I will make you become. Right? So not only does Jesus invite you into life with him, what does he do? He says, I'm going to change you in the process. Over the process of time, if you follow me, you will be changed. In fact, I'm here to say that you cannot follow Jesus without being changed. You just can't. And if you call yourself a Christian and there's little to no change in your life, I would suggest to you that you're not following Jesus or maybe you're not following him close enough. Maybe you're one of those disciples that's at a distance and you're like, yeah, go on, Jesus. You got this. You got this. You can do it. I'm just going to stay over here where it's comfortable and where I'm not in the front lines of the battle. Well, I'm not getting tempted and yelled at and spat at and oh man he just hit him in the face man I got to stay over here hang over here with Peter right Peter followed him at a distance at the end and what did Peter do he denied him right it's this comfortability and if you're not following Jesus close enough then you're not being changed and that's the goal of a Christian is to be changed and here at City Point we have this saying come as you are but don't stay as you are you can come as you are We'll accept anybody through those doors. It doesn't matter what walk of life you are from. Come as you are, but don't stay as you are. The goal is to be changed. The goal is to be transformed. The goal is for you to go from glory to glory. The goal is for you to go from strength to strength, right? That's what discipleship is all about. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul reminds us of this. He says, I appeal to you, therefore. In other words, he's saying, I urge you. I urge you, brothers and sisters, I urge you, therefore, what? By the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, which is your spiritual worship. In other words, he's saying, man, the least you can do as a Christian is offer up your own bodies as a living sacrifice. Why? Because Jesus offered up his body as a dead sacrifice. It's true, you guys. He went to the cross. He got mutilated on his way to the cross. His beard was ripped out of his face, and he was spat upon, and his back was so marred by the stripes they gave him. They, they gave him 39 stripes. If they gave him 40, it would kill a man. And he went to the cross. And so what Paul is saying for all of us disciples in the room, he says, the least you can do <laughs> is offer up your own bodies as a living sacrifice. You're not getting, you, you don't have to get sacrificed. Jesus already did that. But offer up your own bodies. 
And he says, verse 2, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. I love this verse. Then he says this, that by testing, you may discern what the will of God is for your life. You want to discern what the will of God is for your life? Test it with the scriptures and see. Allow them to transform your life. Allow them to transform your mind, and you will see what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Conform, in the Greek, means to form or to mold one's behaviors in accordance with a particular pattern or set of standards. In other words, what Paul's telling us is he's saying, do not shape your behavior to the standards of this world. Do not. You're a Christian. We are to live in a way that is offensive to the standards and patterns of this world. Your life as a Christian should be offensive to the world. Go around and tell people you believe in life. Go around and tell people you don't believe in abortion. And I promise you, you will see how offensive that is, especially in this day and age we live in. Go around and tell people, man, I believe marriage is of a man and a woman. That's what I believe. That's what the Bible says. And I promise you that will be offensive to a lot of people in this day and age. Our lives should be offensive to the standards and patterns of this world, not modeled or molded after them. That you and I should be so transformed by Jesus that when we walk into a room, just the essence of his presence on our lives changes the atmosphere of that room and it commands people to respond to it. You know when Jesus show up, shows up, he commands a response? You either reject him or you love him. There's a gray area in there, but what does God say about the gray area? I will spit you out of my mouth. I would rather you be hot or cold, right? I just, it's funny, up in Breckenridge, um, we go to the same hotel every year for uh, the past seven or eight years, and uh, I was in this, the hot tub one day, and I love being in the hot tub at a, at, a, at a hotel. There's some crazy stuff that goes on in the hot tub, you guys, and you meet all kinds of different people. And in the hot tub, uh, there, was, there was a couple of rough guys. You can tell they were construction road workers, you know, and they're drinking. They got a six-pack of beer that's almost gone, you know, and, and they're offering me a beer. And I'm like, nah, man, I'm good. Uh, they're smoking and stuff, and they're cussing and all this. And then all of a sudden, you know, I spark up a conversation, and everything's going good. And then one of them goes, what do you do for a living? <laughs> and my grin just went, eee. <laughs> I was like the Grinch on Christmas, eee. And I actually asked him, excuse me, what did you say? Because I wanted to make sure he was ready for the response I was about to give him. And I go, oh, I'm a pastor. I'm telling you, man, they cleaned up so fast. It was like, it was like I was a police officer or something, man. They put the cigarette out. They hide the beer behind them, you know. All of a sudden, you can't hear a cuss word for miles. It's like, you know, they clean up their, they, why? Because the presence of God. It's not the fact that I'm just a pastor. No, they, they understand the way to the glory. There's something on the inside of them that understood, oh my gosh, this is a godly man. I'm a man undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. You and I are to live in a way that his presence should command people to respond. Smith Wigglesworth, if you've ever studied Smith Wigglesworth, uh, he was a crazy, fiery man that did some really wild, off-the-wall stuff. But when he walked into a subway station and he sat down in a subway car, people actually started repenting in front of him. Without him even saying a word, there's a story of a man who got on the bus and he walked past Smith and he just fell to his knees and started to repent. Why? Because the essence of the presence of God was on Smith's life. Why? Because he had revival in his secret place. He met with God in his secret place. In fact, there's stories of men who were like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray with Smith, and they would be in the same room, and it would get so hot from the presence of God in that room that these men had to leave. They're like, I can't even be in this presence with you and God. Man, I so want that with me. Don't you want revival in the secret place? To do something right when the doors close instead of doing something wrong? That's what we're called to. So the word... The Greek word for transformed is is the Greek word metamorpho. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. It's from a caterpillar to a butterfly, uh, right? It means to change the essential form or nature of something. That's Jesus' transforming power. He wants to change the essential form and nature of you to what? To a little image of him. That we are to become exact representations. So how are we transformed? Well, the first thing is your spirit is transformed when you get your heart to Christ. He says, I have to transform their spirit. Why? Because our spirits are dead in sin. And when the Holy Spirit comes in on the inside of us, he regenerates us back to life. Where we go from death to life. And now that your spirit is regenerated, he says, hey, guess what? We're going to work on your soul. 
What's your soul? It's your mind. It's your will. It's your intellect, and it's your emotions. And how does he transform your, uh, your soul? He does that through the washing and the regeneration and the renewal of his word. That as you spend time in his word, as you read his word, as you study his word, as you glean from it, and you allow it to change you on the inside, all of a sudden your soul begins to be transformed, which will lead you into your character. How is your character transformed? In the wilderness. Wilderness. I've been saying it wrong all day. The wilderness. And oftentimes, you and I, we run from the wilderness experience. But that's the season where God is shaping you the most. No one was ever changed on the mountaintop. Why? Because on the mountaintop, we're comfortable. We let our foot off the gas, put the car in cruise control. Why? Because life is good. Yeah, Jesus, I'll talk to you here in a minute. Life is good, man. I got this. And then all of a sudden you drive off a cliff, right? Don't run, right? <laughs> and then you're calling out to Jesus, Jesus, save me. Don't run from the wilderness experience. Embrace it and allow God to do the work in you. When I was in prison for those five years, I embraced it. I embraced the time. I redeemed the time, and I studied hours upon hours just in his word. It was just me and the Holy Spirit renewing my heart, renewing my mind, letting him work on my character. And I went to every Bible study that I could, every prayer circle that I attended, every chance that I could get. I allowed him to do the work in me. Can you embrace the season that you were in? In fact, I remember uh, I told my mom, I said, Mom, take a good look at the person I am now. Because when I get out of prison, I, I'm, I'm going to be a changed man. I'm, this man is going to die in prison. You're not going to recognize me when I get out. And I remember you guys when she came to visit me one time, uh, and I'm sitting there just telling her about Jesus. And she didn't know Jesus at this point. And I'm like, Jesus this, Jesus that. He's done this, and he's done that. And I'm talking all this stuff. I'm preaching the gospel to her, and all of a sudden she goes, <gasps> and I go, what? She goes, I can't believe it. I can't believe what's coming out of your mouth. You are changed. You're a changed person. I don't recognize my son. I don't recognize who you are. Why? Because the transforming power of Jesus, a disciple is someone who is being changed by Jesus. Embrace the season that you are in and let him do the work on the inside of you. If I can have Landon out on the keys, that'd be awesome. Point number three is this. A disciple is someone who is committed to the mission of Jesus. We're followers. We're being changed. And we're also committed to the mission of Jesus. Look at our text. And Jesus said to them, very simple, follow me, I'm calling you, and I will make you become, I'm going to change you, fishers of men. I'm going to send you out. You see, in the Old Testament, disciples went more than they stayed. In our Western church, we stay more than we go. We really do. You see, the mission of Jesus is all about people. It's all about making disciples. He says this in Luke 19.10. He says, for the Son of Man, I came to seek and save the lost. That's what I'm here for. I'm here to seek and save the lost. And if we're going to call ourselves a Christian, if we're going to call ourselves a follower of Jesus, then we need to be about the Father's business too, which is what? To seek and to save that which was lost. You guys, the harvest is so ripe right now. The harvest is truly ripe, but the labors are few. And I look out across this sanctuary of 160 people in the room, and I see 160 laborers in this room that should be out in the field sharing their story about Jesus, telling people Jesus loved them, praying for people, inviting people in, and being the hands and feet of Jesus. But we're so comfortable in our pews. We are. We're comfortable in our pews. It's good in here. I'm not getting attacked, right? I'm not getting rejected in here. And it's good. What is it going to take for us to wake up and step outside of our Christian bubble and get an urgency on the inside of us for the lost. We are in urgent times and desperate matters. If we want to see a billion soul harvest, it's going to take a billion laborers out in the field. It's going to. And it starts with you. It starts with me. It starts with us in the room. You have authority to share your story. 
of salvation. And he says this in Revelation 12, 11. He says, and they overcame him. They conquered him. Who? The devil. By what? The blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. Their story. Testify about what? About what Jesus has done for you. Testify, like in a courtroom, what you've seen and what you've heard, the things and the great mighty wonders of what God has done in your life. People need to hear that. That's how simple the story is. And then it says this. It says, for they love not their lives even unto death. All of the disciples, except for John, were martyred, brutally martyred for the kingdom. Let me just simplify this for you for a moment. You don't need to take a mission trip to Uganda to be an evangelizer. Although if God is calling you to that, who am I to stop you from that, right? It's like, you can go to your neighbor. We're supposed to start in Jerusalem anyways. Go to your neighbor and tell him Jesus loves you. Man, I want to pray for you. How can I pray for you and your family? I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. And you may not believe in that, but man, can I just pray for you right now? Hey, I heard you're going through a tough time, man. Can I pray for you? All of our neighbors know that we love Jesus. In fact, the non-believers on the left of our house, when she was going through back surgery, guess who came over and asked us for prayer? It was them. Because they knew. We don't believe in Jesus, but can you pray? Absolutely, I'll pray for you. Absolutely, I will. It can start in our homes. You can share your story with your hairdresser. I've shared mine with mine, and I keep inviting her, and one day she's going to walk through those doors. I just know it. You can pay for somebody's meal and just tell them, hey, man, Jesus loves you. That's how simple it is. And we were at Kobe Sushi a few weeks ago uh, during the marriage conference. And, you know, Pastor Aaron, uh, he was like, I feel led to pay for somebody's meal. And so he paid for somebody's meal. I'm like, well, I feel led now to pay for somebody's meal. I can't let you show me up, so I paid for somebody's meal. And then all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, hey, Rick, are you going to pay for the transgender couple's meal in the corner? He says, you saw them walk through the doors purple hair hair and all. And it was one of those moments where you're like, oh, oh, trying to put my fist in my mouth, you know. You got to practice what we preach. And I said, yes, Lord, I'm going to do it. And I did. And I had every intention of going over there. But as soon as they saw who paid for their meal, I had my Jesus shirt on. They bounced, man. They were out of there. And that's okay. It's that simple and it's that easy. Let me just say this to the parents in the house. The greatest thing you may ever do for God is raising up your children with kingdom-minded values. Your greatest impact in the kingdom may just be raising the next giant slayer. It might just be raising the next David or the next Reinhard Bonnke, right? It may just be raising uh, the next Joshua or the next Caleb. If you're a parent in the house, disciple your children and raise them up in the ways of Christ. Don't let social media influencers disciple your children. Don't let the satanic temple disciple your children. Don't let Taylor Swift disciple your children. You. It's not up to Ryan and the youth team on Wednesdays to disciple your children. It is up to you to do that. That might just be the greatest impact you've ever had. Remember Kimball? He was a Sunday school teacher who invested into kids. And look what happened because of that one man's act of obedience. Let me just say this to those of you who are in the fourth quarter of your life. We're down by seven. There's two minutes left. And the game is won or lost in the fourth quarter. We need you. Don't check out. You're not retired from the kingdom. You might be retired from your job, but you're not retired from the kingdom. We need you investing in the next generation. We need you to become spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers in this house. We need you pouring into the young moms and the young dads in the house. We need you pouring into the youth of this house. We need you pouring into the young adults of this house. Don't become idle and think that you're retired from the kingdom because if you're not dead, you're not done. You're not done in the kingdom. There's a baton that has to be passed. Just like Moses passed the baton to Joshua and Joshua grabbed that baton and he led the children of Israel over into the promised land, into their destiny. There's a baton that has to pass from you to the next generation. Stop judging the next generation coming up with how they wear and what they dress and the words that come out of their mouth and the hairdo that they have. Stop doing that and begin to invest kingdom values into them. Everything God has poured into you over the last 50, 60, years 
and 70 years. It's for you to pour back into the next generation. Will you answer the call? Will you answer the call to disciple, to pour into? You have what it takes, and this next generation needs what you have. They really do. Let me speak to the young people in the room. Those that are living in between. Will you let the old generation, the older generation, disciple you? Will you let them pour into you? Stop judging them for how old they are. Stop calling them boomers. I know that's funny and we laugh, but you guys, we got to break down the chains and the walls that are separating. Yes, there's generation and generational separation, but the two need to come together. Will you pick up the mantle just like Elisha picked up the mantle of Elijah when it fell off of him, when he was taken up into heaven? And you got to think that when he picked up that cloak and he probably is looking at it going, man, what do I do with this? I'll tell you what you do. You grab that baton, you put the cloak on, and you begin to run just as hard as the generation before you. This is how it's been done from generation to generation, passed down from generation to generation. Will you grab the baton? Will you pour in to the next generation? Parents, will you raise your children with godly-minded values in this season that we are in? Stop letting the world do it. A disciple is someone who follows Jesus. It's someone who is being changed by Jesus. And it's someone who is committed to the mission of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, <laughs> this is now the third time, God, that I've spoken this message, and every time it impacts me even greater. I want to be that, Lord, for the next generation. I want to be discipled. I want to disciple someone, God. Oh, Lord, would you break our heart for what breaks yours? Would you break our hearts for the lost? Would you break our hearts for the dying? Would you break our hearts for those people that don't know you, Lord? Would you bust our Christian bubble? Lord, we give you permission to bust it. Bust it, Lord. Get us out of our comfort zones. God, put our feet, Lord, in in places that are uneasy, that are uncomfortable. I know that's a bold prayer, you guys, but it's a true prayer. And so, Lord, would you bless us in that endeavor, in Jesus' name. The last thing I want to do is give another invitation for those of you in this room that do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And maybe you've heard that invitation and you've never responded to it, and I want to give you an opportunity to respond right here, right now, to say, yes, Pastor Rick, I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. I want to commit my life to him. I've heard the gospel message. I repent of my sins, and I believe that Jesus rose from the dead. I want to make a public statement right here, right now. Is there anybody in this room who would say, yes, Pastor Rick, that's me. Just give me a wave right now. Give me a wave right now all across this room. Those of you that are online, just comment online. Vance, look online. Thank you, Jesus. Well, church, I'm excited for this this month. It's going to be a good month. Don't forget our challenge, you guys. Pray for two people this week and invite them to church. Amen.